because he was coming from Germany, got stuck in London, had to go back to Germany, and we weren't entirely sure he was going to arrive, but he did, and we're grateful. Uh, Dr. Dan Weary is a professor at the University of British Columbia, Canada. He's originally from Quebec, moved to UBC in 1997 to co-found the university's animal welfare program. His research focuses on the scientific assessment of animal welfare with a specific focus on the behavior of dairy cows and calves, and I also know he has an interest in fish. Um, he asked me to give the short bio, so I'm skipping the rest of the bio, and it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Dan Weary. Well, what a great pleasure to be here. Um, thanks again for the uh, opportunity um, for, for me to come here to reconnect with some old colleagues. It's actually a, a, a special honor to be here at MSU where so much good work happens in um, farm animal welfare. So let me just put this on. Give me a second. How's that? Clear? Okay. Yeah, so to, so to be here at the home of... Uh, of a lot of great research in animal welfare, of course, the animal welfare judging competition. Um, it's really a special place to be. And thanks to Lena for asking me to talk about calves, which is my all-time favorite subject. And not only that, but to talk about um, this, these issues around calf cognition, uh, which has been a, a, a very fun and interesting area to be working on. Um, I believe it is also practically important for those more practically oriented people out there. So I'm going to talk to you. I'm going to tell you. Tell you a bit of a story. I'm going to tell you basically how I got into this about the various students that have done work in this area. And I hope at the end it comes around and gives you something also practical for those of you that are going out there uh, and doing practical work with, with uh, farm animals, including calves. And on that point, I'll just ask for show of hands for the number of, of practitioners that do at least some cattle work in the audience. And of course. Okay, a good scattering of hands. And what about for the students there? How many of you think that you might be interested in including some cattle work? Cool. Oh, I love it. Yes. Good on you. Okay. Um, okay. So, yeah. Just, I, I, I'll just be telling a story. And Lena will shout at me if I look like I'm going over time. So, um, the, 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 how did I get into cognition? Well, you know, if you'd asked me 10 years ago, I would have said, look, Cognition's got nothing to do with animal welfare. How smart you are doesn't have to do with how much you can suffer. And actually, Lynn and I were just talking about this at the, at the intro. It's like, well, why do we care about these cognitive tests then? And I, and I still think that. I think how smart you are, it, you know, that, that even very, uh, I, I don't want to say dumb animals, but sort of more cognitively less complex animals maybe have just as much opportunity, maybe more opportunity to suffer than we do. But I think cognition can be interesting in a couple different ways. Partly because I think it can give us a window into when animals aren't doing well. And also I think, and we'll get to this more at the end with the experiments I'm talking about, is I think sometimes that if we do something to rear an animal that makes it less than what it can be, including less than what it can be cognitively, that that's, that that's important for us to realize. And, and also I think the cognitive work, I think another bit which is, which has got me thinking anyways, is as, as, as you learn about what animals can do, it makes you sort of, I mean, for the people, and I think many people in the audience would be like that, animal people, um, that, that's cool to learn about what animals can do. And there's something exciting and interesting, and it makes the animal, actually, it makes the animals more interesting, and I think in a way more important to us when we understand the complexities of what they can do. Like those cool zebrafish with 109 behaviors, isn't that cool? I bet there's more than that. That's all that we know now, right, Kevin? Okay, so here, anyways, here, here's something that got me into uh, thinking about this cognition in calves. Um, and this is an experiment by Andrea Vieira, who's this wonderful student that, that actually came initially as a visiting student. We had lots of visiting students. She was from Brazil. She did this project, and it, was, it worked out so well, we invited her back to a PhD. So um, this is, she was interested in calf feeding. We've done a lot of work on calf feeding. And she was interested in why sometimes calves have a hard time uh, getting to work these automated feeders. And many of you guys maybe have seen these. These are little robotic feeders. Um, and so you can see here, th there's a little machine here, and it's got a teat, and, and when the calf comes in, it's going to read its ear, and the calf can go drink, right? All makes good sense. And the wonderful thing about that is, is it means you can have this group of calves, and they're all just fed by this one feeder, right? 
Well, problem is that all the calves want to go eat at the same time, typically. So here's one calf uh, uh, wanting to get in the feed at the same time, trying to push the other calf out of the way. But the other calf is, seems to be happy and spending lots of time in there. Um, so one of the things that Andrea did is she just looked at, at one of the things that's going to affect how busy these feeders are, and that is the amount of time each calf spends in the feeder each day. Now, the guys that want to sell these feeders want to make them look cheap, right? They say, well, so one feeder will work for 20 or 30 calves, right? The problem is, and you can see it here, when we're feeding the calves the standard rations that... Uh, that, uh, that we often uh, feed calves, which is just about a gallon a day, um, the ca average calf is spending a little over 100 minutes in the feeder. So do the math, right? That's not going to work with even 20 calves in the group. Now, the really odd and counterintuitive thing that Andrea found is she bumped up the milk allowance. So you think you're going to feed the calves more milk, they're going to spend more time in the feeder. So here she actually is giving the calves as much milk as they want to drink. And what does she find? They spend half as much time in the feeder. So what's going on? Well, what Andrea did, she looked a little bit more carefully about exactly what the calves were doing when they're in the feeder. And what she found is, not surprisingly, these ad libitum calves, they go to the feeder more often to get milk. On average, those calves, and it changes a little bit with age, but on average, over the age range she's looking at them, they're visiting the feeder about five or six times a day. Now, these four liter a day calves, they only, the, the, the computer tells them they're only allowed to go twice. They get two meals, okay? And this is the way we normally feed them in captivity anyways, right? So this is fairly standard. So the calf goes, two liters a, a, has these rewarded visits, two of these rewarded visits, and on this side they have about five or six of the rewarded visits. Unfortunately, the calf just doesn't go in the feeder when it's supposed to, when it can get milk. It goes to the feeder a bunch of other times. Um, and now, for the calves that are fed ad libitum, they can go to the teat whenever they go and actually put their mouth in the teat, they get milk. But sometimes they'll just stick their head in the, in the, in the raceway a couple times a day. So they come on an average of a couple of these unrewarded visits. But the limit-fed calves, they'll do about 25 of these unrewarded visits a day. So what is this calf doing? that it can only get milk twice, but it keeps on going back and going back and going back. So it made us think a little bit more about, well, what, what, is, what is this equipment to us, and what, is this equipment, what does that equipment look like maybe to the animals we're dealing with? And so I think from our perspective, especially the sort of more techie types, I, you read me, you know, I, you get you into this, there's all this beautiful glossy uh, hardware, you know, this, uh, isn't that gorgeous, all that sort of blue plastic and uh, stainless steel, and this beautiful user interface, you could program all sorts of things. And so, and we, of course, know what the rules are. We told, we told the machine, yeah, you know, the calf can fed, at, you know, at uh, 8 a.m. and 8 p.m., and it gets two liters each time, so the rules are perfectly clear to us. But to the calf, maybe... The feeder looks more like this, right? It's like, I don't know when I'm going to get fed. I'll try now. No, that didn't work. I'll try now. And then every once in a while, it goes in, it pulls a lever, and woohoo! it gets a milk meal, right? So, um, so and, and, and then, you know, that made us think a little bit. Well, okay, hmm. If, if, <laughs> if, if, uh, if the calf feeder is a one-armed bandit, maybe we could use this sort of uh, this, this gambling behavior to see, well, you know, is there times when calves maybe feel lucky? <laughs> so, um, so here's just some data to get you thinking of this, and this is what sort of thing that made us think about it. Is if you look, and this has been reported a number of times, this was from one of our PhD students, Fernando Berderis, and he was looking at a bunch of ill calves. Unfortunately, calves get sick a lot, so it's pretty easy to find a, a sick calf. And here's the number of non-nutritive visits this calf is doing and this is a limit-fed calf. You can tell it's a limit-fed calf. Why? Because it's going 25 times a day for these non-nutritive visits, right? Uh, and it's bouncing around. And then all of a sudden, boom, it comes down to 15. And Fernando's a veterinarian. He's going and checking in his best possible way all the clinical signs of the calf every day. Anyways, three days, three days later, he sees the calf comes down um, with scours. And so, um, you know, what's going on here? Is it that the calf starts to feel ill? Is it starts to feel ill before you actually see symptoms? I mean, that would be cool if it's the case, right? But I'm, and this is, I mean, for the students who don't already recognize this, I'm obviously leading you down a garden path here. Right? I'm trying to tell you a story which fits, which I hope fits the data, but this is a long way from evidence. So can we try to bump up the scientific credibility of this story in some way? And in particular, can we, in a, in a more scientifically rigorous way, look at these sort of changes in cognitive 
uh, functioning and cognitive tasks in animals as a window into how they uh, see the world, how they perhaps assess their own condition. Um, and it turns out that actually there's a, a, a big growth of research in this area now. And, and actually for quite a while it's been also used, even in our assessment of humans, for example, um, uh, an indicator of depression in human patients is that they'll respond to otherwise neutral stimuli as negative. So, for example, if, if you show a picture of, you know, of a patient a happy face or an unhappy face or just like a neutral face, uh, a clinically depressed patient will be more likely to, to it when, when they're asked to write a paragraph or maybe tell a story about the person with a neutral face, they're more likely to say, oh, the, you, know, you know, something bad's happened. There's a, they're more likely to imagine this, that there's negative consequences in a stimuli which is otherwise neutral. You also see uh, other kinds of tasks, for example, um, uh, stimuli which might be perceived uh, scary are perceived as much more scary by somebody who is in a depressive state. So something like an umbrella opening rapidly or something like that, a looming stimulus. And uh, hopefully you're asking yourself now, well, okay, fine, talking about human patients, how, do we, how would we do a task like this with animals? How would we ask a dairy calf if the glass is half empty or half full? I'll show you how. So, and this is, by the way, again, uh, it's, it's an old trick of the trade. I'm going to show you lots of experiments that look cute and easy, but in fact, there's a whole mountain of poor students that have devoted uh, years of work, often it, it, uh, resulting in, in loss of tears and unhappiness and, and many failures before you get to the success. Um, but this is a success. And this is work now done uh, initially by Heather Neve, and then we've had a bunch of other students have used the same paradigm. And what we're doing is we're training calves now. So we got our, our, our super smart dairy calves to get them to do some, um, some, some learning tasks. And how do you get a baby calf? Hello, puppy. Yes, I know. Um, how do you get a baby calf to learn something where you provide it the thing which it's most motivated on earth for, which is a nice sip of milk from a tea, right? And... Uh, what Heather did is she uh, set up her beautiful calf pen and she had a computer monitor in it. And uh, different calves had different training regimes. She would, she would reverse them back and forth. But for the calf, I'm going to show you when the, the screen was red, the calf went up and it approached the screen. And when it just got within about 10 centimeters of the screen, um, uh, that counted as a screen touch. And then Heather would get out a nice bottle of milk and put it into a slot and the calf could come along and drink it. If the screen was white and the calf went and approached it, then there was no milk. In fact, the lights went off in the uh, chamber for a, a period of about 10 seconds and the calf couldn't do anything and the calf found that extremely upset. Okay? So after a period of time, you can imagine the calf learns to approach the red screen. And I'll show you what this looks like now. So here's the screen. Uh, here's a beautiful television a calf pen equipped with a television monitor, a computer monitor. This is what we call the start button, which basically was just a target area for the calf to stick her nose close to when she wanted to play the game. So Heather was there, and she just waits. The calf can play the game when it wants, and it touches the button, and then Heather knows, okay, I'll turn on the screen. And the screen randomly goes red or white, and, and then the calf goes and approaches the screen, and this calf now has just had a milk meal. So it's off in the corner, just on the side of the screen. You can't see it. It's having a nice uh, sip of milk. Okay. So touches the button, approaches, it's red is good, right? And listen... That's a happy cat. It's not just playing milk. That's happy. Uh, Touches again. That's not a happy cat. Come on. No. Ah. Uh. So the calves are actually really smart. If, if, if they, once, I mean, like all animal training, this is all about us learning how to do it, and once you get the task working right, the right kind of rewards, the right kind of setup, it's actually, the calves are super smart. I, I really think, now the dog's out of the audience, I can say it safely, I think the calves learn it faster than a dog would. 
Um, so anyways, uh, th that's nice. Um, uh, and then what you do, of course, is you make it a little bit tricky for the calves. So you say, okay, we know what the, what the full glass is, that's red. We know what the empty glass is, that's white. What happens, and the calves have never seen these before, they've learned now, like the calf you saw, to sort of perform perfectly. What happens when it sees a half empty glass? What is it going to do? And this isn't anything new, right? I mean, this is old B.F. Skinner 100 years ago doing this kind of stuff. And what you get, Skinner would have told you, is you get, and the calves are just as good as the rats, um, you get a beautiful generalization function, okay? So here is our positive stimulus, and the calves, there's no standard errors on this for a reason. That's because the calves always go. They know, that they know what they're doing. And the same thing, oh, the negative, even though I'm missing an E, it goes, it, it never, they, they always, they never go to the negative. So again, no standard errors. But you put these tests, these probes, these intermediates, and they go, well, you know, about half the time if it's halfway, a little bit more than half if it's close to the positive, a little bit less than half if it's close to the negative. Classic generalization function. Okay, so far so good. But, remember we set you up, we're saying, okay, what happens if something bad happens in the calf's life? Then what is it going to, how is it going to treat that half-empty glass of water? Or in this case, the pink video screen. And the, even though I said that calf illness is uh, way too common. If you're doing an experiment, you have to sit around and wait for the calf to get sick at exactly the right time. It's, it's not an easy experimental system to work on. So you have to come up with other sort of bad things that happen in the life of a calf. And so we picked a fairly obvious one that uh, Catherine mentioned earlier, which is a, one day somebody comes in and, and, um, and, and disbuds it or dehorns it. And so here's uh, calf going through hot iron dehorning. Now, the nice thing about this, you know when it's going to happen, right? The calf doesn't know what's going to happen, but we know when it's going to happen. Um, and what I'll say to you is, um, uh, I mean, these are our calves, and we do a, what we think is a very good dehorning procedure, including um, a local block and a sedative. So the animals are out of it during the procedure itself. However, there's still going to be post-operative pain, right? And this is a burn injury, and so there's going to be post-operative pain for the hours in, uh, after the animal wakes up and is recovering, at least 24 hours afterwards. And so you can ask the question, well, during that period of post-operative pain, you know, is, 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 that, is this affecting the calf's mood state in such a way that it's going to affect its cognitive functioning? And the way you do it is you generate one of those generalization curves that I showed you before, and then you go and disbud the calf, and you look in the 24 hours after when it's experiencing pain. And what you find is a bias in exactly the way we, place we bet. So here's after disbudding. Again, it doesn't affect how good they are at recognizing. They still want to drink milk. They still go 100% of the time. They still know when the bad color is. They still never go to it. But what they do is these half-empty glasses, they treat as if they are empty. In fact, the quarter-empty glass, they treat as if it's completely empty. Right? So they're showing this, this negative judgment bias um, uh, in the way we'd expect. Okay. That's, that's pain. I think that's interesting. We can talk about that. Oh, I meant to say, if anybody at any point has any questions and want to stick up a hand, feel free. And I really hope uh, if you don't stick up your hand as you go along that you really have questions afterwards. Yes? I'd like to know, on average, how long does it take the typical healthy cat to learn that trick? To, to learn to, the, the initial red white? Oh, jeez. Um, I mean, I, I, can, I can just look up some learning curves after when we're done. But uh, I would say... You know, to be 100%, maybe seven or eight sessions where they get a bunch of pairings. Um, but I've got, I've got actually some learning curves I'm going to show you later on. Uh, so we'll come back to that. But not that many sessions. I, th I think, yeah, again, you know, if you, if you brought that beagle in, they'd probably be about the same. And, and they're quiet. Okay. So, oops. Um, uh, so, uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, this is such a beautiful result. Uh, you, you should never believe it the first time, so we did it again. Um, this is an experiment by uh, another student, Ron Daras, and he came in and, and repeated it. He did some other cool things, which I'll tell you about in a second. But it's just to show, and actually we've now done this in, in, a, in a number of studies, and it's a very consistent bias you get, especially right around this near negative, where um, after dehorning you get this treat in the glass like it's, like it's more empty. Okay. What are some other bad things that happen in the life of a dairy calf? And Rao uh, was interested in, um, in another uh, 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 procedure that happens. Oh, I'll come back to you in one second. Just let me finish my sentence. Another procedure that happens to calves, and that is that someday um, they get weaned. And what weaning is, I'll come back to in a second after the question. No. 
Not in this experiment, they didn't. Yeah, so these are, these are animals without good post-operative pain control. Okay, have they been done with post-operative pain control? That That's the obvious question, eh? Yeah. No, we haven't got that one yet. Oh, sorry. So the question is, so we see th these animals had a set of and a local block, so they, they, they were experiencing no pain during the procedure, but after the procedure, they weren't receiving uh, post-op pain treatment. Uh, and the question is, what happens if you, pro you provide the post-op treatment? And, I mean, my hypothesis is you should be able to reverse that. Okay. Weaning. So the nice thing, again, about weaning is we know when cows are going to get weaned. Um, and the other thing that uh, is interesting about weaning situation is it gets, we, we, uh, weaning can mean a bunch of things. Now, for a dairy calf, often when we separate the calves from the mom really early in life, what weaning means is when we take away the milk. Um, but in our group, we've also been really interested in how to calves benefit from social relationships. We've done a lot of work on grouping calves, including pair housing calves. And uh, Ruan was interested, well, what happens um, if you have calves reared in, in a complex social environment? What is it like then when they're separated from an important social partner? And he was actually really interested in this, uh, what happens to the calf when it's separated from mom, if it, is, if it does spend more time with mom during the rearing phase. And I've got this beautiful slide here just showing that uh, weaning is nothing new. And in fact, this is a very sophisticated way of weaning calves, which is a fence line weaning, um, where the calves and the, ca and the cow can still stay in physical contact but can no longer nurse. So it's actually a very cool way of weaning. And it was obviously invented in 1879, as is documented in this reference. Um, we've... Um, uh, we've uh, done a bunch of different work in different uh, social housing things. I'll talk to you, tell you more about the pair housing later. Um, but as I said, Ruan was really interested in these um, complex social groupings. Now, as I mentioned, um, weaning means a bunch of things. It means separating from the mum, but it also means being separated from milk. Uh, and I told you already, our learning procedure involves this training the calves to be motivated for milk. So in this experiment, what we wanted is calves that still had a relationship with mom, but weren't dependent upon her for her milk. Hence, the cow wearing the bra. Okay? Works actually super well. Um, and uh, what happened is these calves and cows lived in actually quite a, 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 a sort of basically a typical freestall bar, free barn where they hung out together but didn't nurse. And then we did this type of fence line weaning where in this case there's a creep area just on the other side of the freestalls, right? So the cows and calves could still hang out. But then one day, of course, the inevitable happens. Even though we're trying to make this as gentle as possible, the calves aren't dependent upon milk. The calves have this sort of gentle period of fence line weaning. One day, the mom goes away to another part of the barn, and the calf is there by herself. And the question is, how does the calf feel about that? And we can use that exactly the same technique I showed you before, in this time, not looking at the physical pain of disbudding, but this time looking at sort of the emotional pain of social separation. And this is what you get. Exactly the same cognitive bias. So here, the percentage of times they're approaching the screen. Here's the positive. Again, they're going 100%. The negative, they're never going. The intermediate ones before, where they're showing the normal generalization function, and then after being separated from mom, even though they've already gone through this gradual period of weaning and they're not dependent upon milk, and you see this uh, more uh, glass kind of half-empty calf. Okay. So, conclusions from this first part of the talk is... Cognitive measures can, so I have to admit, I was wrong 10 years ago in terms of thinking that these cognitive measures are useless. I think they can be useful actually at getting at these kinds of mood states in animals. It actually provides a new way of getting at these kinds of mood states in animals. And there's, it, can, it can expand, I think, our sense, our understanding of what animals experience uh, in relation to these procedures. And I think that the pain one has, has made me think a little bit differently about this pain because one question I often get actually comes back to this issue about, well, post-op, you know, you're there trying to convince a producer at least to use a, a nerve block, right? And, okay, you got them doing that. And they say, well, you know, really we should think about something post-op too. Well, why does it really matter? The calf seems to recover fine. And I think a result like this at least makes me realize that, yeah, well, if this is something that's affecting the calf's mood out for 24 hours after the procedure, that suggests to me that it's an important thing for the calf. 
Um, so I think it's, it, it is uh, useful data, and we can talk more if people, later if people are interested in terms of, uh, of how we could use this kind of data to help make us, get, give us better information to give to producers so they can make better decisions. Yeah. Um, in, in different experiments, we've used different, um, different sexes. Um, so we've used both males and females in this. Um, the, because we're, tri we're uh, in, our, in our normal disbudding procedure at our farm, we actually do it really young. We do it at about three days of age. Because we wanted these calves trained up, we actually used older calves. So uh, we actually use caustic paste. We use it at standard, our standard procedure at a much younger age. In this case, we're using hot iron at, at six weeks because we wanted a calf that was all trained up for these other purposes. Yeah? Okay. Okay. So we talked about uh, measures of cognition as a welfare indicator. Let's go on to using measures of cognition as a welfare outcome. So... Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's okay. You can try. Yeah. Um, was was the training done as a supplement, or was that their feeding for the day? I'm just that, that was it. So the calves are earn their keep. So they're what, earning their they're, keep. They're doing this experiment you got it. Exactly. plus getting the the time with mom. Exactly. So, the, and the time with mom is just, and actually this is, I mean, we can talk about this later. This was a, it was actually a very cool series of studies on this, um, on, you know, what is it, basically understanding the relationship, of the, that nature of that cow-calf relationship. I mean, you what, took what the milk we out We thought, because we actually did treatments where the cows and calves were nursing normally as well, I and mean, it's not related to the studies I'm telling you now, but it, as a part of this larger project. And the student that's working on this, this is Julie Johnson, fantastic Norwegian PhD student, veterinarian. Um, uh, she, um, her prediction was that it really was going to not be able to, to nurse mom was really going to affect the relationship. She could find no evidence that the actually nursing strengthened the bond at all. These cows and calves seem to have in every way that she could measure and assess a perfectly normal social interactions, despite the fact that there was no milk transfer happening. Yeah. So in, your other, in, in the other experiments, yeah. the, the calves that were allowed to nurse, yeah. was there a difference in the, the training? Oh, okay. Did, so we, no, did you see it, a discrepancy it, these are different. between... So, the, yeah. the big, Sorry, big study. No, it's okay. Go, no, no, it's a very uh, normal. Um, the, it, it, uh, we've done a bunch of work on these sort of complex cow-calf systems, um, and it, 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 which doesn't relate to the cognitive work. Sorry. And so <laughs> if we want to do the cognitive work, we have to have the calves earning their keep by, by, give, by working for this milk reward, so they can't be sucking mom. So, yep. we, we, so mom we, had the bra on the whole time. Exactly, for, this, they, okay. for, for this bit. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Cool. Okay. Yes. It, you mean it, with, with, how does milk transfer affect when? No, go ahead. The moms, did they respond cognitively the same way? Oh, yeah, the mom question. Super cool. I, thank you. Yeah, so, um, you know, here I'm showing the, what, what does a calf think. But what, the other, of course, in a, and it's a two-way relationship, what does a cow think? And you know what? We haven't done that. I actually think, in general, uh, in terms of this sort of understanding the cow-calf uh, uh, the management systems where we keep cows and calves together, I think actually that's a super important, perhaps a more important question. It's just we didn't have the tools to do it in this study, but I, there's, a, there's a PhD in that, you know. <laughs> Good question. Yes. Yeah. Or did you do any kind of work where you were looking at um, just handling stress for the debutting process? I know they were sedated and things yeah. like that, but does just handling the calves in that manner without the disbutting process, does that cause the same negative selection pressure? Yeah, so very cool question. And, and no, no we, haven't, we haven't sort of tried to tease that apart. I, I, I mean, I, and I think it, it really needs to be done. Actually, one, one, one thing that I worry about and it comes back to more generally questions about disbudding protocols, is I wonder about what it feels like to actually... We were doing the um, uh, sedation with cytosine. 
I, what, what does it feel like? What does the induction recovery feel like just from that? I think our handling itself is super low stress. I'm not. And these calves, these are our babies, right? They're mm. at our university farm. These are super well handled uh, animals. But, um, but I think there could be other things that we're missing. So, yeah, cool idea. So what I want to get onto now is this, is this, the, this, this sort of more general question about, well, are we, how does our routine um, handling and management for, for our calves maybe affect just how smart they are in general, their cognitive complexity? And um, again, this came, um, this interest came partly as a result of the stories, the results I showed you earlier where we started doing this training on calves and seeing they could, they could do these cool things. But also out of this work we've been doing for years now in terms of social housing for calves, um, so here's just our standard, one of our standard calves. This is one on our farm. Uh, but of course, great many calves are just housed in these calf hutches. And if you think in a more naturalistic situation, um, calves are rearing in these very complex environments where they have interactions with, with, with their own mom, with other cows, uh, and of course with other calves, maybe of the same age or of different ages. So these complex environments, they have to, to be a successful calf in this environment, you've got to learn a lot, right? You've got to learn who to approach, who not to. Um, when you make a mistake, you get disciplined by others, all these kinds of things, right? And you compare that with the kind of environment that we're typically providing for the calves, and it wouldn't be surprising, perhaps, that that might have important effects in terms of the cognitive development of these animals. Um, here's uh, our calves. Uh, we're often using these pair housing. So we just take our standard uh, calf pen. There was a, uh, a barrier in here. We remove that calf pen. So this is about as simple as you can get when it comes to a, a social group. It's just two calves. And we haven't done anything to the barn. We just removed a barrier. But just this little change seems to also have effects. And this comes back to Andrea Vieira that I told you about before. She was doing work on this pair housing. And she... Uh, it, she, she was looking at a bunch of practical things like weight gains and feed intakes, that kind of stuff. Um, and then on the side, she started to look at what these calves did when they were eventually grouped. And this, of course, makes sense because even if we keep calves you know, in this kind of environment in the first weeks of life, we don't bring up baby here all the way until uh, all, all throughout her life in these kinds of environments, right? We need her eventually to function at least well socially with other cows. And so Andrea got interested in, well, what does the calf do that's been reared individually when it first meets another calf? So here's a video to show you what it does. And here we've got two calves here. This is a calf that had actually been reared just in one of those pairs, okay? So it spent its entire life in that double pen, but with a friend. And here's a calf that had spent just the pen next door, right? Uh, but it was in a single pen, the white one. And they've just been gone into this new area. So it's new for both of them, and they've just gone in. And this is what happens. So uh, this is quite difficult. The, 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 the pair house, the black one, goes to approach, and the white one sort of freaks out. The white one that's been individually housed. After a while, the white one quiets down. But then again, look at approach, and it runs away. So it doesn't seem to have that initial sort of noise. But then after a little bit of time, what happens, it almost switches. That once the animal does approach, it won't give up. It, it's like that annoying kid at the school ground that you know follows you around. Um, it can't. It doesn't seem to be able to modulate that behavior. You can see uh, here it's just sort of uh, sort of continually no nosing the the black calf, and the black calf tries to walk away a bit, and the white calf will just keep on following it. This goes on for hours. And so, I mean, we didn't just watch these videos and tell the stories. We have to actually record the data and show pretty graphs, too. So here's a pretty graph, um, which is latency, the amount of time it takes for a calf to first approach another calf when it's put into these environments. And it's always like this, right? We have calves that have been reared side by side, but one in a pair and one individually. And the pair calves approach the other calf very quickly. The individual calves, what is this? About four or five times longer to approach. So this greater fearfulness of novelty. And once they do approach, then what you find is the individual ones don't give up. They're more persistent. They keep on following the other calf around. While the, the paired ones will do the approach, they'll uh, be some contact, and then they'll go on with the rest of their life. Okay.
So as I said, of course, all calves, even when they're individually reared, someday get put together. And on our farm, that happens um, uh, typically a week after weaning. So we, we have the calves in, in, in our smaller, either individual or your pairs. For the first six weeks, we wean the calves for milk. So they're established on solid feed. They're doing fine. And then all of a sudden, we move them over into this group pen. And so here you have a bunch of calves that have just been put together for the first time. And um, in these ca- in the, of, the, of these calves here, half of them have been reared in these individual pens, and half of them have been reared in pairs. And uh, Andrea followed these calves, and she looked at a bunch of, in this case, practical things, like how long does it take for the calves to start eating, and how well do they gain weight? And what she found is this amazing difference. So here you have your um, paired calves, and this is the amount of solid feed intake. So these are calves, as like I said, they're already weaned. They're already established on solids. But still, on the day they go into the new pen, their intakes are down a little bit, but they pick up, and then they just keep on growing nicely as the calves grow, right? The solid intakes increase with calf age. The singly housed animals don't eat a thing in the first day. In fact, even on the second day, they're not eating. By the third day, it seems like they're able to discover where the solid feed is and make use of it, and their intakes don't really start to catch up until almost two weeks later. Now, what's going on there? Why is that? These are calves, as I said, they're already weaned, they're already salvaged and sold. What's possibly putting them back? And what our, our hypothesis was, or I should say Andrea's hypothesis was, is that the calves, because of this heightened response of novelty that I showed you, and because of this persistence that once they've learned to rule, they keep on doing it, even when the game changes, that they're just unable to make sense of this new environment, this new social environment, this new feeding environment. And because of that, it takes them just a long time to get started. Okay, again, though, what I've done is I've told you a story, right? And what I want to do now is walk you through some data to show you why I think the story is correct. I'll also tell you that this isn't just a calf phenomenon. In fact, and this is one of the embarrassing things for me, working on calves, in fact, working on social housing calves, social housing calves for a decade, and, um, and, I, and without really thinking about the broader literature on this, and actually, we've known from work on rodents for decades that actually these kinds of individual housing systems can have profound effects in terms of how animals develop cognitively. And so we see this evidence of cognitive rigidity. So once they've learned to rule, they stick to it, persistence. And we see evidence of neophobia, being scared of new things. Um, We also see evidence of brain differences, but I'm not going to talk about those now. Um, And it's not just in the rodents, of course. We have these old, old experiments going back to Harry Harlow, uh, where we know these, these vast differences, cognitive differences, can happen to primates when they're reared in, um, in impoverished social environments. Okay, so what about our baby calf? And so here we have one of our individually housed calves. And again, I'm going to go back to that, that enriched social housing, sort of the, 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 the strongest comparisons, these calves that have been reared in these very complex environments with other calves and cows. And let's look at their their cognitive abilities. How do we do this? We'll go back again to our training task that I showed you before. So this is we, you know, get the calf to learn to go to one and not go to the other. And I promised you I'd show you a learning curve. So here is one. And it shows that the calves, so that basically these are the days after we introduce the negative. It takes them a a while before um, they're showing, you know, they're showing a a very high level of correct responding. So uh, at first they go to all of them. So uh, uh, the correct no-go response is at zero. But after a period of a few days, they get to be very good. They get up to our criteria of about 80% after about seven or eight days, and then they plateau up close to 100%. Okay? These are our calves that are in the enriched social housing. What about our calves that have been reared individually? They show exactly the same pattern. So our individual calves are able to learn the task just fine. However, remember what I showed you in terms of that slide with the rodents. The deficit comes not from initial learning, but it comes in this terms of this cognitive rigidity. How do we test whether these animals are rigid learners? And the way we do that is we put in a game changer. So we have these animals that have learned this beautiful thing, like those calf I showed you. They're always going to the red one. And then you go in, and it's mean, right? That all of a sudden, red is bad and white is good. But that's what we did. And um, what you find is this is that, so here it looks like the calf's doing disastrously, right? But in fact, the calf's doing really well because it's just following the old rules. 
So it's, it's 100% in terms of the old rules. It's just 0% in the new rule. But the socially housed calves, after three sessions, they, they basically start taking chances. They start switching things up. And that ability to switch up is what pays off because they see that, ah, it's actually the other strategy that's working. And after a few days, again, after about seven or eight, they're up to criteria again. What about the individually, individually housed animals? They never get it. And again, we've replicated the study a number of times. The individual calves just don't get it, even if we give them twice as many sessions as required by the socially housed animals, the individually housed animals can't get the fact that the rules have changed. So I, to I told you that what we're doing there is this sort of this highly enriched environment versus our, our, our a sort of our uh, in complete individual housing. As I mentioned earlier, we're actually interested in a bunch of different social housing systems for calves. We're actually big proponents of this, this pair housing as a way of getting people started on social housing. Uh, um, uh, Catherine and I were talking about earlier about sort of finding management solutions that work for different managers. And there's some calf managers that can pull off this sort of super complex things, but many can't. And my argument is that almost everybody can pull this off quite well. Um, so, uh, Becky uh, Meher, who's a postdoc in our group, did an experiment where she looked at a, a variety of different social housing treatments and saw how those worked. And so here you have our complex group. We have calves that are just paired, but they're paired just a few days after birth. And then you have another group here that's paired much later, six weeks. So just in this case, they're weaned at seven weeks, so just a week before weaning. So it's just a different way of doing it and our individually housed calves. And this is a percentage of calves that ever make the criterion. And Becky found about 20% of her calves would meet the criterion when they're individually housed. It goes up to about 60 for the late pair and then about a little under 80 and a little over. Over 80 for the group. Yes? Yeah, so I mean, what's the nature of individual housing in this case? So it's, it's that calf barn I showed you before. These are, uh, it's, it's just a, uh, uh, a row of individual pens, and uh, they can see if, the, there's a, if there's a calf in front of them, for example. They can't touch. So they can't no touch nose another to calf. Nose contact, yeah, you know, interesting, there's been work on this bit, not on this cognitive bit, but on other issues. Um, and it looks like actually, and I really think that for this behavior, or for these features we're seeing here, it's actually the is actually being affected by the behavior of another animal that matters. So that why, is, why is social housing having these profound effects on how you learn? It's because if you do the wrong thing with a social partner, you find out about it. And if I'm contacting another social partner between bars, you know what? I'm not going to learn from that. Uh, at least that's, I mean, we haven't done that experiment, but I, 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 I believe that the magic of social housing in terms of resulting in these, co in these cognitive effects is because you need to be able to have this type of learning to, to be able to function well in this more complicated social world. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. The, the other thing, we also talked about these novelty effects, right? This neophobia. And um, so this is a, a calf looking very scared when we put a rubber ball in front of it. Um, this, oh my goodness, it's a rubber ball. We were talking about the, uh, the, the cat snake meme earlier. Uh, so this is the, the calf's equivalent of a, a cat responding to a snake. Um, and, uh, and so it's one way. It's just a consistent way you can look at these kinds of novelty effects. Um, and here's Becky's results looking at the group housed animals in relation to the early pair and the individual. In this case, we don't have the late pair. The late pair are the same as the individual in this case because we're testing the animals at four weeks of age. And what you can see is that it's really the grouping that seems to work in this case in terms of having animals that are less fearful, quick to touch. But what I've showed you in this case is quite an artificial test, right? You could say, okay, if I'm a calf, uh, if I'm a dairy farmer, why do I care about how a calf's going to respond to a rubber ball? So uh, in our group, we've also been really interested in trying to come up with more, um, more naturalistic tests, tests that are going to matter in a real-world environment. And we asked ourselves, for the calves, when is neophobia going to be important? And the natural answer, I think, to that is that in terms of all these dietary changes we throw out at our farm animals all the time, depending upon uh, their uh, age, their production stage, the availability of different feedstuffs, the cost of different feedstuffs, um, we're changing diets for dairy cattle at least all the time. And of course, dairy calves get a number of changes in diets in their lives. And so it's very easy to ask the question to a dairy calf, 
what do you think of a food when it's first presented? So in this case, it's work um, by Joao Costa, who's actually just finished his PhD. And he looked at providing calves their very first opportunity just to eat hay, which is a fairly normal kind of feed. And just to shake things up a little bit, he provided a feed that calves don't normally get, which is chopped carrots. Okay? And uh, he just looked, he put these feeds in front of the calf for the first time and says, well, what does a calf do with it? So here's calves uh, that are individually housed in their first exposure to hay. Um, and this is so, uh, sort of a defined period. I think it's a 30-minute period. How, much, uh, how many grams of hay do you eat? Um, and here's those individually calves uh, eating carrots. And they'll eat a little bit more of the carrots. Okay, so far so good. What about the socially housed calves? They eat, uh, well, what is it? Three or four times as much hay and about twice as much carrots. So just their first response, right? But it's an indication, a much more naturalistic, maybe if you'd like practical indicator, of why maybe it matters on a modern dairy farm to have animals that are, that are smarter, yes, but also in this case less neophobic. Um, we've actually, I mean, I'm showing you this result here because it just fits in beautifully and also because it's another one of Joao Costa's results is just total intake of solids over the full sort of first 10 weeks of life. And we've, it, we've actually seen this result now for over a decade in a bunch of experiments, but I don't think we really properly understood it until I've showed you some of the results. I'll come back to you in just one sec. In, until, um, until, uh, until I've showed you some of the results I just showed you before. And that is that, these indi that the, that the um, socially reared animals are eating more solid feed before weaning and after weaning. Uh, in this case, we again have that treatment of these late pairs versus early pairs. And again, what we see is the early paired animals are the ones that are really benefiting in terms of their early intakes. And that's translating to weight gain. So again, we've known this for years, that the paired animals do better in terms of eating more and growing faster. And I think these cognitive results help make sense of that. Question in the back. Yeah. Just one sec. So the, the indi the, how do we measure individual intake in group calves? Great question. So um, in individuals, easy. All, you, how much feed disappears from the bucket? In a pair of animals, what we do is how much feed dis disappears from that pair. Because as soon as you put a pair of animals together, you don't have independent data from each animal. You just have the, the pair. You average the pair. And so it's actually, it, that's actually pretty easy. Yeah. Um, when it's a much bigger group, um, and you can see we don't have that here, so those like that super big complex social group, we weren't even trying to measure that there. Um, we have, and I don't know if you noticed in some of the uh, uh, data uh, pictures I've showed you, for our, for our own big group housing, we've got a bunch of automated feeding systems that can detect who the calf is and how much she eats, so we can detect solids from a group environment as well, but not, that's not the data I'm showing you now. Yes. Yeah, so, so great question. And so the, the, how does this feed intake relate to how fast calves grow? Now, this is solid intake, okay? This is how much calf starter and hay they're eating. And, uh, and we'll come back to that later, but I, actually, if there's one important thing for calf people out there, just realize the absolute most important thing is to be feeding them more milk. Um, and because that's the only way the calves are really going to grow in this period is by, in this, especially the first four weeks of life, is by drinking the milk. However, the only way the calf is going to wean nicely is by being well established on solids. So getting those solids into the calf early is important, not because it's an important source of nutrients in those first few weeks of life, but because it helps the calf take off once it's weaned. So yes, early intake of solids has an, a, a, a small effect before weaning, but a very important effect after weaning in terms of weight gains. Hi. Yes. Um, have they followed them through to the novelty of milking and the milking yeah, system and exposed to question. that? Yeah, that's a question, yeah. No, so, I mean, we haven't done, I mean, the, the, we haven't done the lo a bunch of the long-term stuff. And that's, to me, again, an, an interesting question about, um, you know, actually, I think our modern dairy farms are a super complicated place. Calves have to deal with all calves. Cows have to deal with these group changes, diet changes, dealing with milking robots, dealing with automated feeding equipment. And so this whole thing about responses to novelty and also... You know, why would you want a smart cow? Well, I mean, anybody who's tried to take a cow who's always been milked by going in the left side of the parlor, and then you bring her in on the right side of the parlor one day, and has had to deal with that cow, 
that's somebody, I think, who might appreciate the value of having animals that aren't so scared of novelty, right? Are able to deal with, with, um, with, uh, with changes in the rules. Okay. So, conclusions from that smart calf bit. Um, I think that, I hopefully I've been able to convince you that our individual housing system, and it's important to understand here for the non-dairy people, we didn't create individual housing to be mean to calves or anything. That, it, it, we, this has happened, it's a system that was developed for its own well-intended reasons, and it turns out it's a system that's having detrimental effects on cognition. It's important we realize that, but this is not to blame the people who developed it in the first place, because that absolutely was never the intention. Um, the important thing to realize is that so, social housing results, I think, in much more normal ability to learn these rule changes. And also, social housing has this very positive effect in t terms of making animals less fearful. I, I, I alluded to this briefly, but um, because I know that some of you, after this, are going to go back and deal on real farms, it's important to put these sort of more um, uh, esoteric results into context in terms of calf rearing programs. And I think the first result is an easy one. I do think that understanding this effect of pain on mood states, it is something that I now use when I talk to dairy farmers about the importance not just of using a pain block during the procedure, but about using a proper post-operative pain management. So I think that's important, and I hope you'll, I hope you'll share my enthusiasm for that when you talk to, to the clients you deal with. I also talked about this effects of social housing on calves, but I wanted to put that into context, I think that's really important. Social housing, as I mentioned briefly, these are, uh, social housing is, is a part of a management system and it needs to be done together with other parts. And first and foremost, you cannot put calves together unless you're feeding them properly. And by that I mean that you're feeding them more milk and that you're feeding them via teat. Because if you're not doing that, what you have is a calf that's highly motivated to suck on something else because it's not getting any sucking stimulus and it's not getting enough milk. And what it will do is it'll suck on the other calf, right? So this is important. So the first thing you deal with is getting the calves more milk more normally. Once that's going well on your farm, then you can talk to your producer about starting to put calves together. Um, I, I, won't, I won't talk about the forage feeding, but I think it's important too. Um, the social housing and all these other bits, and again, that's just sort of a, a, a practical thing for producers and an area where if, uh, if anybody's interested in talking about that in the break, uh, I really think that one way of bringing these kinds of results home to producers is by showing them how their calf management procedures are working for them. Actually, one of the sobering things I find in terms of working with dairy farmers that know an awful lot about how much milk is in the bulk tank is they don't know very much at all about how fast their calves are growing or a lot of other practical things that we could be doing to helping the dairy farmer themselves judge their own dairy rearing program. And I think with that data, that helps them see if there's holes. And then that helps them see whether there might be benefits to them, for example, of feeding their calves more milk or taking advantage of some of the benefits of social housing for their calves. And with that, I just want to thank, again, the organizers. Real pleasure to be here. The audience for your questions and my funders. Quick, quick question. I could. Oh, just, just a quick question. Ex really interesting data. Thank you so much. Fascinating. What is the end number on the calves that you've done these studies with? Uh, the number of experiments and the number of calves. Number of different calves. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I would say, I mean, it depends, on, it depends on which bit of data you're interested in there. Okay. But we do, so um, we, we, we try never to show a result unless it at least has been published. And ideally, if, it's been, if we've replicated it at least a few times. So in our standard experiment, for the, it depends whether you're looking at a behavioral outcome, a health outcome, uh, uh, a, you know, let's say a weight gain outcome. Um, but if it's a well-designed behavioral study, sometimes even, let's say, eight or ten animals is enough in an experiment. Uh, um, but typically we'll do multiple experiments. For, to get good results in terms of the weight gains, uh, you probably need more like about 20 animals per treatment in order to get that to work properly. So yeah. my next question yeah. was, 
do you anticipate seeing a strain or a breed uh, difference? Because I noticed all of you had oh, yeah, Holstein. Cool. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, jerseys respond the same. Uh, Herefords. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, you know, I, I'd, I'd love to that. I, I, yeah, I mean, we're, we're, you know, we're, we're, our, our farm's Holstein, so, you know, I, I love Holstein. Uh, but, you know, I mean, that's just, that's just me. I, I do think that it, the... Uh, the, that we get similar issues in other breeds. Actually, the issues around, interestingly, I think jerseys actually are super interesting in part because they show a lot more stereotypic behavior. I think a lot of that stereotypic behavior has to do with problems in terms of nutritional problems at the early stage, including not enough milk, but actually comes back to forage feeding as well. But anyways, I don't know, I don't know very much about jerseys, so I shouldn't talk too much about it or I'll get in trouble. Um, but yeah, super interesting question. Yeah. Did you track sickness between early and late pairs? Did you see a change Question. Okay, or thanks. different things? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, this is a, and this comes back again to this, the, the practical issues of how do we get group housing to work? And because um, there's no point in putting a bunch of animals, and this is, unfortunately, this has been the situation we've been in. Is we've had, you know, people with a bunch of individually housed calves, and then someone will come along and they'll sell them one of those automated feeders, and then they'll have 30 calves in a group. And, you know, I mean, the odd time, the guy's a magician and can manage it, but it's super hard to go from uh, these very different management systems. Um, it's one of the reasons that I really promote small groups is actually you can get these things to work and actually you can get the milk feeding bit to work first, higher rations, cheap feeding, and then you can get pair housing. All the available evidence on pairs and small groups is that actually those, those calves are healthier. And we can talk about why that is for a bunch of reasons, but th there's certainly no evidence that, those, that there's more illness in small groups. There is evidence of increased risk of illness in large groups. And by that, I don't mean to condemn. I do see people out there that are able to manage these big groups successfully. It's just, it's not something that's, that everybody can do. Uh, at least not without some practice. Yeah? Good question. Yeah. <laughs> ladies, ladies, I say it's important to mention that the beef calves and the dairy calves are reared in a little bit different way. Yeah, so a absolutely. I mean, I think that's one of the things when, when we and some of you might have noticed those when I had my complicated uh, social housing. Those weren't dairy calves. It was actually, I mean, it was a, it was actually a farm in Brazil. Um, but that's our, st our standard cow calf uh, uh, ranch. That's exactly that's the way calves grew up, right? So it's not like it's this foreign system. It's actually there's a bunch. You know, there'll be farm side by side. There's cow calf guys. That's the way he manages the calves, and the dairy farmer manages them in a different way. So it's not it's not impossible. However, for the dairy guy to get this to work right, it's not trivial either, Lena. I mean, I think it, it's you know it, it's you need to you need to, and I think that actually that's I, I'm convinced, anyways, that these small groups at least provide lots of benefits for the calves. It's a way of getting there. It, it, it leaves the whole cows out of the question, though. And I think that's another question is, you know, how might the cows benefit from continued contact? And anyways, I, again, I won't get into that unless I have to. Yeah. I have a question. Um, I want to talk about learned helplessness in dairy cows. And I'm wondering if you think that by increasing the ability of these calves to use their brains, they're going to be more difficult to deal with when they get into the milking string. Sorry. <laughs> cool. Okay, cool question. Um, you know, th this handleability, of course, is a huge issue. And I think it's something, it, sometimes people ask this question, actually, even in terms of individual versus social housing, because the individually housed calves is super interested in you. Why? Because your mom, right, comes up. And what does it want to do? Well, it wants to suck out your finger or your clothes or whatever. A, a calf that we rear with uh, milk feeding with a teat, with high rations, shows way less interested, especially if there's other animals. Those calves are actually not necessarily uh, highly fearful of you. In fact, I showed you that some of those weird fear responses are actually more common in the individual animals. But the animals, uh, there's obviously a habituation aspect of those animals that come and can drink from you every day. Okay, however, I think you're asking a little bit more of a, a, a more complicated question, which is, you know, if we give these calves this larger brain, in a sense, by rearing them in a more, in a, in a more complicated environment, does that mean these, these animals are going to, you know, 
take over the place. Um, and uh, you know, actually, I mean, that's a, another, a, another talk, but um, uh, you, because we can train these animals to do a bunch of cool things, we've had cats trained to actually, you know, open latches on gates and all sorts of different things. And it's possible they will. I mean, it's, it's possible that they will be harder in that sense. Um, I do think, though, and it comes back to what I said earlier, if we, hmm, there's two things. If we want animals to succeed in the more complex farms that we're creating now, I think we can't blame them. We can't be angry at that cow that won't go in the left-hand side of the parlor if we've brought her up in a world that she doesn't have to learn these kinds of things. And, and so, and, but also I think, and this comes back to sort of the issue, well, why do we care about smartness? I, I think we've, if we've done some, if we've reared the calves or the cows that makes them less than what they can be, I don't know. That makes me feel bad. I don't know why it makes me feel, but it does. So, and, and I know that. So that's the. I, I think that's important at least to talk about that. We're we're using rearing systems that are making the animals less than what they can be. Does it matter? I don't know. It matters to me. It matters to me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we've got 15 minute break, um, and I think there's something out there either to eat or drink, and. We'll be back to see Martin and Quinn in 15 minutes. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dan.